Strategy, Ken. Strategy. Meaning of life. Meaning of life. It's something that, that one. We've had some issues, not issues, but you know, closings have been challenging the last couple of weeks. Uh, the last couple of years for many people. And um, a lot of a lot of the information, a lot of our decision making is more born on strategy with a good understanding of the contract, right? But it's it doesn't start with the contract. It really starts with strategy. What? Who is the buyer? Who is the seller? What is the issue? What is the property? Is it special? Is it not? Um, those things are so relevant when making decisions and kind of find compromise. I, I just love this topic. I love it. I call it. I call it knowing the story. I always have to be able to tell the story to an underwriter. So when I ask for people to explain everything, I need to know everything because I have to be able to tell the story. There you go. I love that. Tell the story. Know the story. Um, you know, it's funny, though, as lawyers, we don't want to know the story. I don't, I don't, you no. know, normally, lawyers don't care about the story. Right, Dad? We always we're looking Possible at possible deniability. Talk. We weren't there. You can't prove it. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> it's funny. I tell I tell my customers that I'm their loan attorney. Like you tell me everything and then. I'll give you doctor, patient, privilege, or <laughs> client, attorney. <laughs> you got, you got lender, client, <laughs> confidentiality. Is that a thing? Correct. Correct. <laughs> correct. correct. You, you lie and I'll swear to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't look good in orange, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the strategy is the fun part. I, I enjoy the strategy. Well, we'll give it a minute, Jerry. Thanks for joining. Hey, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you kind of inspired this topic today. Uh, He's the master of strategy. Came into your office uh, yesterday, and you know the the question kind of on both of our minds was we we had seen a couple of deals fall apart recently, and the agent kept going back to the question of what did I do wrong. Right, Jerry. What? How could I have fixed this? How could I have done this differently? What could I have said? And and Jerry, you were pretty helpful in that regard because you have you have you have a perspective that's somewhat unique. Um, what was it? What was one of the things that you were most driven by yesterday? I mean, you you were pretty kind of you were pretty built up on this topic. You had a lot to say. <laughs> All right, get ready. Right Where are you actually, begin, Jerry? Actually, let me put a tie on. <laughs> um, I, I think the most important thing is understanding your customer's personality. Are they hyper? You know, are they hyper? Or are they calm? Do you, do you need to prod them more to get answers? And once you figure that out, that's how you should be looking at them through the whole process. And um, you start that when the first time you meet them. You know, not everybody's blessed to be dealing with somebody they know, and in most cases, you're not. So by understanding the personality and so on gives you an opportunity to determine how you're going to react when you're challenged by them by certain issues. And the only reason why I know that is not knowing that early on in my career. And, and getting great learning experiences by not being able to handle the reaction that I sh did have uh, when faced with a question and so on and so forth. So I can't answer why what you did wrong. There may have been something you did wrong. But the real answer is your conversation with your buyer or your seller. And the first point is this. What is their motivation from the very beginning to ask you to help them to either buy or sell? And that could be a reminder you bring back to them when there's a situation that could be a speed bump. And say, hey, Tom and Mary, you said to me, you want to be in there by the end of next month. Well, we're already at the first of the month. So going back on this or doing that and so on. So I think it's really important that you get an understanding of your people. And be consistent in your responses. They may ask you the same issue several times. Building trust is being consistent in your responses to them. 
if there's going to be a change in your response, make sure you clarify why your response is different from what you told them the last time. And I've never changed once I decided that they were the things that I ne really needed to be doing to try and keep things in check. But let's just say this. You can't reason with people that don't want to reason. There's a lot of ulterior motives why people change their mind. We don't know. Maybe the guy got to notice he's losing his job or all of a sudden he got divorce papers sent to him. Mm -hmm. So there are issues that you're really not going to be able to, uh, mm -hmm. able to overcome. And um, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, and your the personality is part like where you're from, what do you do for a living, right. your past experiences, anybody with health issues in the family. Um, I mean, I remember spending an hour with you just on the strategy behind doing uh, a mailing. You know, what do you put on the card? What do you leave off? You know, the, the strategy. Uh, so you're great at it, Jerry. Well, thank you. Well, and Not that great. I think when Jerry said the word motiv motivation is really, that's the key word. I think that's correct. That's well, really you know, any, you anything know. you're faced with in a sales position. I mean, uh, I like to say you can always tell when it's raining out. If you're an agent, you get a call from your customer you haven't worked with in a while because we've had 30 or 45 days of completely sunny weather. And they haven't bothered you because they still played mm -hmm. golf or went to the beach or whatever. But the first day there's rain and there's clouds in the sky. Be ready to get a call from somebody you haven't talked to in a while. Check their motivation again. Is it yeah. still about wasting gas money for you? Or are they really interested in having something? Are you saying that a buyer might waste your time? No, uh, only if you let them. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so if I were to take big, big points off of what you're saying and summarize it, you have to be a good listener. Absolutely. This is not about us. It has, we are the facilitator. We are the grease in the wheel. And if we're not doing a good job listening, then we're putting the grease in the wrong spot. You know, we're, we're forcing it down people's throats when that's not what it requires. So in, the only way to know someone's motivation is to hear them. Um, or, or what was it? White men can't jump this, the line. I'm trying to remember what the line is, but it's something along the lines is, is that you hear me or you listen, you hear me, but you're not listening. You know, you know that I'm saying something, but you well, that's no the line you use with I'm your saying. wife. I hear you, dear. <laughs> but that doesn't say you agree. How's that work for you, John? <laughs> hasn't worked at all. My wife picked up sure. five minutes. Drop that, <laughs> drop so that suggestion. Think, so I've had a couple of agents recently, and it's not just one. There were there's a, a, a couple of them where deals have gotten really challenging. And in those moments of stress, um, they've doubted themselves. They've basically said, <laughs> you know, look, I I'm not comfortable. Um, you know, I don't know where this went wrong. And I and they kept saying to me, they said, how do you know? You know, and, and they, you know, I'm not trying to use this as a way to booster my boost, bolster myself, but they've given me a compliment by saying, hey, you were able to calm them down. What what did what can you teach me about that process? And it really goes to what you were saying, Jerry, is that you have to listen to them first. You have to really know what their motivations are, and then you have to remind them of them later. Use that as a tactic. And so uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Jerry. And Mike, thank you for joining. Um, I actually make the analogy to um, Alcoholics Anonymous. So yeah, in AA. Or, or, you know, maybe in like your stages of grief, maybe that's a better way to put it. I was going to ask, how do you know about AA? Stages of grief. <laughs> and the first one is denial. Uh, the second one might be, um, you know, anger. And then it might be sadness or fear. And then eventually you end up at acceptance. And I use those uh, in a similar <clears throat> fashion when I'm working with someone is that, I'm going to go with like what tends to work. I'm going to remind them about the contract. I'm going to remind them about mm -hmm. their their other thing. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to yell at them. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to cry. And if that doesn't work, you know, I'm just going to try it all. I'm going to go down the process and I'm going to try and get a reaction that I can then use to help them or to help myself understand their position. Um, it's to me, it, you can't just shove it down their throat and expect a different result every time. Every person, every situation is different. 
and you have to be flexible enough to kind of change on the fly. But you said something, Jerry, yesterday. You said things change, things happen. And knowing context, knowing kind of where that change happened, you have to be aware of it. Um, I'll give you some examples and we can kind of play off of this. And Mike, you were in that conversation as well. It was kind of a fun one, which is where I wanted this, the motivation of this class was built from. But here's the first scenario. We had a listing uh, agent who had worked with this seller before. They own multiple properties. It's kind of a big deal. It's unique. It's very expensive, uh, multi-million dollar properties. And there are a couple of them. And the seller who, who recently bought these is like, well, you know, let's put it on the market. Let's see what we can get. And the listing agent has been trained and in all her career has been saying to herself, all right, we have to price it based on the market. You know, here's our market, here are our comps. Now we can price it. I'm going to give you a, an expectation of what we should list it for. And the seller totally ignored that recommendation and said, I'll, you know, double it. I know I bought it for a million, put it for two and do it for all of them. And the listing agent was really struggling because it was not what she was expecting. It was totally outside of the lines of what she had trained on and seen in the past. But she also, she, and so she was struggling. She's like, I don't know if I can work with this seller. This is not realistic. This is ridiculous. And she, she called me and I told her, Jerry, I said, I said, my number one rule in the office is don't fight with the client. Don't fight with the client. They don't like that. So I said, listen to them. What is their motivation? Why are they trying to reset this market? You know, do they realize the downsides of doing this? And if so, then you can decide, all right, do I do I agree with this or do I think they are totally crazy? Mm. Have you seen things like that where like the, you know, because I know, Jerry, you do a lot of teaching on listing appointments and, and you know, pricing it is a big part of that. What is, what is your expectation in the scenarios like that where the seller's got a totally different perspective and there might be a different type of seller? This is not a this is not a home that they live in. So. So, you know, I like to say this, the stand that you take depends upon where you sit. Mm. Okay. So the market we just came out of, do we think that every property was selling for what the last one sold for? Or did they sell it for more? And if they did sell it for more, what was the price? So the market we have been in, I'm not sure about that being the case now, but the market we were in, if somebody said, well, I want to try this. I'd work on them to try and get a limited time period and see where it goes. But I wouldn't fight them because I don't know what the price is going to be. Everything doesn't sell for what the last one sold for. Yeah. And well, God I mean, forbid, if we were back in the recession period. I know what it would sell for. It would sell for less than what the last one just sold for, whether it was five minutes ago or five hours ago. That's not the market. We're in a little bit more balanced market right now. And I like to think that the challenges are we still have investors here. And I'm sure that was an investor that she was talking to. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't a personal purchase where they were going to live there and they were going to go back north after the end of the season. So once again, the stand that you take depends upon where you sit. Understand who your customer is and what their motivation is. You have to understand. You have to peg your customer as best you can. Is this a sophisticated investor? Is this um, an elderly couple that, you know, is just trying to sell their only asset before they, you know, kind of figure out their end of stage, you know, for their life? And, you know, or, or is it someone like your daughter, who, uh, Mike, who is buying her first home and, you know, hasn't been through this process before? And or maybe it's a, a brand, you know, the first time the seller's ever listed a property and they need to be properly educated about what the expectations would be, what the downsides are if they overprice it. Um, and then what the upsides are for cor correctly pricing it. So yeah, it you have to understand your client well before you even give your opinion, right? So what I my advice to her in this scenario was your client is different. You do not, you're not dealing with someone who doesn't understand the risks here that doesn't have something, you know, else that they're working on. This is someone very sophisticated, has done the math on it, and they're demanding that it be done differently. 
Um, and I think that's such a neat opportunity, but she didn't see it initially. She didn't understand that that's what was on the different level. So by kind of roping me in on it and talking with the sellers, I was able to pick up on that a little bit differently. And that was similar to another buyer, uh, this on a different deal, different agent. Um, this buyer had made five offers in the last five weeks, um, and they kept lowballing the sellers. And I think their mindset was this market is overpriced. And actually, I don't even know if they use those words. They said, this is an expensive market. And I said, yes, you're right, exactly. And then when Nettie said, okay, well, that's why I made my offer. I said, okay. And then, and then I let him talk more. And he said, um, you know, why aren't the listing agents even responding to my offers? I said, well, know the context, know where you're sitting, right, Jerry? We are kind of at the beginning of season. It just turned March 1. Uh, we've got a, a bit of a runway here before the summer would start and things might slow down more naturally. He said, so a listing agent that gets a low offer uh, early in the market might tell their seller, hey, look, let's just not, let's just wait. This isn't worth taking right now. We can take it in a month or two if you want, but not right now. And so when I explained that to the buyer, he, you could tell, you can almost hear the hamster wheel spinning in his brain when I was talking <laughs> to him because he was picking up on things. He goes, that makes perfect sense. I totally get it. And, and then he kept saying, well, maybe I should just raise my offer. And that was huge because he said it not me it was awesome mike you raised your hand now i'm lowering it uh i would argue that while it might be a sophisticated seller it might be he's making a decision without having all the information and one thing that i would point out is that a lot of the high-end deals still tend to be seasonal christmas to easter and so it's it's easy to say, let's double the price. And let's say after a couple months, you figure, well, we didn't get that. <clears throat> well, now when you got your summer season coming in, that's a different kind of buyer. Now, there are still some high-end deals in the summer, but there's a lot less because why you have more seasonal high-end buyers Christmas to Easter is because a lot of people come down for the winter months they have the money to come down for the winter months and enjoy it down here and then go back home for the, the, the second half of the year. And you're going to miss all those buyers if you have a price that's so high and there's you don't have a do-over. Your do-over is wait to next season. And there's a carrying cost for those properties. So I, I think you nailed it. You're 100% correct. Um and that could be the best advice for these sellers. Mm -mm. Absolutely. Um, Can I give a counterpoint? Yeah, please. Which which I use. Uh, if it's in the $3 million range, like you and I were talking about this morning, uh, I have in some instances advised my seller to deliberately not respond. Uh, the, the buyer's anxious. The buyer's demanding something that contractually he's not obligated to, uh, he's, he's not entitled to. Uh, and, and the seller, you know, if it's a $3 million property, doesn't care if the property sells this year, you know, act like you don't care, don't appear motivated, play hard to get, and uh, let the other side sweat. Some, sometimes just not responding raises the anxiety level on the other side. And the flip side of that, as you mentioned earlier, Christian, the realtor who is starting to question themselves, you know, I'll tell them, you know, uh, the old uh, YouTube video I've, we've talked about, you know, fear is contagious, anxiety is contagious, it bleeds through on the phone, uh, and I've told more than one realtor in that situation who's questioning themselves, don't talk to the client tonight, wait till the morning, calm down, you're making me nervous, you're going to make your customer nervous, so if you come across as nervous, you're just going to add fuel to the fire, so you got to be calm you got to project calm if you want your customer to be calm so sometimes you know the, the timing is on purpose if you're dealing with wealthy people you know let them sweat we don't care we got tons of money jerry you mentioned that yesterday as well that sometimes you shouldn't be responding right then and there 
especially when you're drinking. You need a minute to think about it. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I learned that the hard way. Okay. Is there a story there? No, well, no there's too many stories there. Let me <laughs> let me just say, going back to the counter, the uh, person putting the house on the market, it's still your initial conversation with them. If I put it at that price, how long do you want it to sit well, till we don't get an offer? Because what we don't want to do is be an enhancement for somebody else's property to sell. Is this the only price you're willing to take an offer on? We have to wait. You you need to answer those questions. Then you don't have to worry about, well, how come all of a sudden I just put it on for three million bucks and it should be two million dollars? Try and get something that causes you to make a price uh, reposition at some point in time. Yeah, Don Don hit a very relevant point, and it's not an easy one, and that is understanding the seller's motivation for selling. And unfortunately, particularly on the high end, um, a lot of times it's hard to get a read on what their real motivation is. You might be hearing one thing, but what is really behind the motivation? And if you have a good read on their motivation for selling, I think it helps you as far as uh, giving advice or, or giving them information so they can digest and decide you know, which way they want to go with a price or when to put it up for sale. But understanding that motivation, it's kind of a skill that longtime realtors kind of develop. But uh, it, it is very important to try to understand their motivation. The, the market now, before we were talking about it, was strong seller's market. Okay, that's why we had people making offers standing in line out front, outside the front door. That's no longer the case. Now we have more days on market. We have less than full price or over list price. So the market has slightly changed to the, um, I don't wanna say a balance, but we have buyers taking a normal process more so than they did before. And we have sellers still thinking they're gonna sell it for what their neighbor sold for two months ago. And that's the challenge in this market right now. But if you still understand the motivation of who you're working for, does the seller want to sell? You don't have to know exactly, but you can ask them. So let me ask you, Tom, we got a quick offer on this. Where are you folks going to go? We're not going anywhere because I haven't looked yet. So you already know it's a fishing expedition and I hate fishing. So I don't participate in things like that. Buy my fish. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Uh, yeah, and I think the other big motivator, the, the elephant in the room that we always have to address, I would recommend you address at some level, is what are our motivations? So as the attorney, as the um, realtor, broker, we need to be transparent about our own motivations. And so if I had a seller, if I was going to a listing appointment and the seller just kind of says, look, it's four million or bust, and I'm thinking it's worth three million. I'm probably not, I, I'm not doing them any any uh, any benefit by saying, okay, fine. And, you know, because there, there are agents that will, they'll accept that listing agreement, they'll throw it on the market, they won't educate their client about the downsides of overpricing it. They won't even have the discussion. But their motivation is, well, if I get the listing, I'm giving myself a shot. Whereas if I, if I fight with them on it, maybe I don't even get the listing. And so what I would say to a seller in that scenario is, yes, we can do that. I always start with that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Happy to do it. But here's the other things to consider. Number one, I'm going to be way overpriced and I don't work for free. Like Jerry, I don't fish. It's just not something I, I, I like to vote. I don't fish. Um, I think that's a very good distinction to a seller. It's like, look, you can do that, but you're wasting your time and you're wasting my time. Um, and then, it, then maybe we can derive more of their motivation out of it. Maybe we can understand them better at that point. That's, I think that's a really neat tactic to kind of just throw all the cards on the table. In fact, Absolutely. There are times when it's appropriate for you to walk away from a listing. Yeah. Basically say, you know, I'm not going to be the right person for you to handle this. At and that's point. what Mike was getting to on his suggestion. And I'm a little out of focus here. 
So on his suggestion, he's thinking, look, even, you know, even a high-end property can be overpriced and it can really dog a, a seller and it can make it seem unattractive. You're a hundred percent right, Mike. And you have to be aware of that stuff is that, are they playing you? Are they taking advantage of you? Is it a fishing expedition? Is this something that's just a waste? Um, you know, that's a really important distinction, but it's not that simple either. And that's why we love strategy is that you really have to understand it to be able to act in the moment. And if you need to reserve judgment, just say, I think that's, I think that's great. Let me just kind of think it through. Let me call my broker. Uh, let me call the attorney and see if there's anything else we haven't considered and I'll get right back to you. Um, I'd be and curious if Jerry, you use this strategy when, when I'm dealing with somebody who's you know, hesitant, some some wealthy buyer from up north who wants to move down here. Uh, I'll tell them how old I am. I'm saying, you know, are you anywhere in my ballpark? Is this where you want to live for the rest of your life? Are you tired of living in Manhattan, for example, or downtown Chicago or uh, Boston or, or wherever it is? Uh, and, you know, and bring into the mix, you know, what dollar value do you put on where you're going to spend the next 20, 30 years of your life, God willing? Uh, you, you get them out of the details of the contract somewhat to, you know, where do you want to live? Do you love this place? Does your wife love this place? If so, and you're in, you have, you're, you're blessed enough to have this much money. Do you care if it's a little bit over? That does, um, how much do you care? Well, and the, the important thing on that one does, um, you have to understand your client before you can have that type of quiet, calm conversation, because yeah. if you're not listening, if you don't, if the buyer is not making any of that, those distinctions and it's an investment or whatever, or they've already discussed that, we don't need to bring it up again. Or, it's or a, it's a delicate it. thing. I mean, it's, Very delicate. We've, had, we've had enough enough situations where we're responding to a buyer's request and we talk to the realtor and find out that, oh, they met the buyer and the buyer loves the place and the buyer was there with their mother and my goodness, they lost their last two offers. So we know what kind of leverage we have. So, you know, that there are intangibles, you know, that, you know, how much do they love it and how much are they willing to pay for that place that they're going to call home, where they're going to send their kids to school if they're a younger couple or where they're going to spend their retirement years if they're an older couple. Um, and not everybody can pull it off. You got to be, I think, um, you got to do it a certain way. You got to be a certain age. You got to have a certain life experience, I guess. Yeah. Um, we had we had some deals recently where it was pretty complex. Um, one of the deals, buyer and seller were kind of renegotiating right up until closing. And there were all these unknowns. And then all of a sudden, a property in the same condo pops on the market that night. And now the buyer is like, look, you want to make a deal with me? I'll just buy that one. It's yeah. priced better. And that was a huge motivator. Uh, and, you know, we always look at it as, as attorneys. We want to understand the whole picture so that we can best navigate the landmines. We can give our buyer good advice based on what the seller is going to use against them or vice versa. You have to know both sides. You know, having been involved in this business for a few years, I can't remember how many substantially overpriced listings ever turned out well for either the seller or the agent. And remember, if you take reluctantly or not, if you take an overpriced listing and it doesn't sell, you're complicit in putting that property on the market overpriced. So you can't stand on the sideline because I've had sellers say to agents, you took the listing at that price. Now you're beating me up to lower it it's not going to work out. So think twice before you take a substantially overpriced listing. Well, and I think there's a discussion that you have with them. Say, look, I'm going to accept this. Let's put it on market. I understand your, your reasoning here. I think it's great. Here's your downside. And just don't use it against me later when I come back to you, when we need, you know, if we need, if this isn't working, what's the plan? Can I come back to you in six months if we haven't gotten any offers? No. Okay. that's fine too and if, if the seller were to say no maybe that's why it's been it. on the market for four years in a row and never sold okay yeah. Yeah. you'll be the fifth agent so I, the big, I do wish in my scenario i wish i could give you guys more information on this deal and why i advise the client to overprice it um it's a really fun deal 
It's really complex and sophisticated. I just I love it. So you're and the problem. I'm part He's of the problem, problem, and I'm okay with it. John, I'm you totally know this? implicit. I, I I failed, Jerry. What can I tell you? <laughs> All right. So a couple of the things I wanted to point on before we um, we kind of open up the floor to everybody, but you know, I want to I want to re uh, rediscuss or, or go over again the fact that it matters whether we're in season or not. It matters what price point we're at. It matters what kind of buyer. Is it a full-time resident or is it a part-time resident? Is it an investor? <laughs> um, is it someone that is, you know, just brand new to the market or been here forever? You know, the way I would treat Jerry is different than the way I would treat Kent, which is different than the way I would treat Mike's daughter. You guys have different perspectives, different uh, risk tolerances. Um, and that part is so relevant and how you're going to use the property is relevant. Jerry's from New Jersey. Yeah, if you're dealing with someone from New Disclaimer. Jersey. Disclaimer. <laughs> Work release program. Jerry responds to like physical violence, Please. that's all. Please. Right. So Ken, I need you to explain to me what... <laughs> Can you try and give me, I mean, obviously you work with a lot of a lot of buyers who are going to get a mortgage. Um, so Kent's with Fidelity Direct Mortgage. Um, Kent, can, what is what is your client worried about? What is a buyer? How much how much leeway do most of your buyers have to renegotiate things, to to take on uh substantial increases in insurance or property taxes or things like that? What you know, it's a different kind of buyer than someone who's paying cash for a million dollar deal. Insurance has been a big thing this year, after, obviously after the storm, because, you know, I always estimate those and it's really difficult to do now because insurance rates have gone crazy. But for us, it's just those certain milestones that are in the contract appraisals, one you got to get over inspections, one you got to get through. Um, but it's one of the pieces of advice that I give uh, to, to people when they're doing that or putting an offer in is, and I've talked to Mike about this a little bit and Jerry is ask for a seller concession, whatever it's for percentage, whatever the case may be, because it gives you a negotiating chip to work with. So if we're talking about strategy, if you ask for a 3% seller concession, they can say, no, that's fine. But now it's something that you can take off the table that you maybe didn't even really need, but it was a chip that you had in your, in your pocket versus just price. So it's something that I like to talk to people about because we're getting a lot of those right now. We're talking about getting to a balanced market. It's getting there. And I'm seeing a lot of seller concessions. And it's something that you can use as a tactic to have another thing to negotiate with. But as far as the different steps, you know, it's basically for us, it's appraisal inspection, underwriting stuff I know on the front end, um, the client I know on the front end. Um, so it's really, you know, appraisal inspection. Well, I think that's pretty... Pretty important to understand what you're saying there, Ken. Thank you. Um, the buyer, as a listing agent, it's, if the buyer is kicking the tires on your property and they're going to be getting a mortgage, you can't just treat them as if they're a cash deal. You have to try your best to understand their own limitations because if you're asking for something from a buyer that's un unreasonable and would never work for a buyer getting a mortgage, then we're wasting our time. It's it's kind of the old, um, it's actually not that old. There's a movie, I think it's called Fracture. It's one of my favorites with Anthony Hopkins. And um, they asked the attorney, or the attorney asked the detective multiple times the same thing. And he just said, you know, where's the gun? Where's the gun? Where's the gun? And the detective responds and says, what are you just going to keep asking the same question until you get the answer you want? And he says, that's what lawyers do. That's the response. That's what lawyers do. Well, we can't do that in this kind of deal. We we can't just force it down a buyer's throat if they're getting a mortgage because it will never work. We can't force it down a buyer's throat if they're only seasonal because they won't care about that sort of thing. Or they, you know, maybe they they're not going to use it the same way your seller used it. Maybe your seller not having flood insurance doesn't matter because the buyer is going to need flood insurance. <laughs> You know, so we have to change our perspective to best suit this this closing. You know, the, I always say it's a three headed monster here. It's, you know, get it under contract, protect your client, get it closed. And you got to get all three of them. Mike, uh, do you mind sharing with me? You know, we you and I have kind of discussed this a lot uh, within your family and some of the challenges that your family's had in buying, you know, your daughter's buying a house and she's looking around and, you know, 
how you would treat your daughter when when she's buying as a full time resident is very different, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, there's. Be careful, Mike. <laughs> I, uh, I is your door closed, Christian? I gotta make sure. <laughs> this is being um, recorded, Mike. <laughs> for those that don't know, my daughter is looking for a uh, first time home, and uh, the low end market is largely disappeared. I mean, there's still some properties out there, but uh, every Sunday we do open houses, and literally there's a train of people going into each low end uh, property. And you know you have to move quickly because uh, you, you want your offer to be considered. And so it's been an eye opener for me, to be quite honest. And uh, frankly, we've lost out on a couple deals. Uh, yeah, you know, we put in very good offers, and, and but we we've, we've lost out now. And this Mike, case, could, excuse me, Mike, could you define low end? I'd say below four hundred thousand. Okay. Isn't that crazy that that's our new definition? Yeah. Today's paper, it's half a million. Uh, but, you know, each season is different. I mean, what we go through Christmas to Easter can be quite different than what we go through in the summer. And I think one of the important things, Christian, that's common with every season is as realtors, we've got to, when you're going after a listing, you've got to show your value. And a lot of your value is do you understand what is going on in the real estate market? And yeah, I'll give you some breaking news here. In February, uh, our listing inventory went up 10%. Now that's unusual. That listing inventory should be going down in season, but it went up. So what's going on in the market? And so the more information you can share with the prospective seller, uh, it certainly helps, but it goes the same way with the buyer. In my daughter's case, she is financing her purchase. So it's important for my daughter as a buyer to know uh, what is she up against? And if, if you know going in that you're up against a lot of cash offers, then that's probably going to dictate how you come in with your offer that has a finance contingency. You might have to come in a little higher than you want to just to get the seller to consider your offer compared to a cash offer. So it, it, it's a very, you know, it, it's a very interesting process going through this. And I, I can tell you as a father uh, going around with my daughter, it, it certainly gives me uh, a lot of insight into what people go through. I've never been through that. Well, and behind to open, uh, look, help people see behind the curtain a little bit. Mike and I have had discussions about this, and I've talked with your daughter about it as well. And I, I've said a couple of things. I don't, I don't know if I'm right or not, but my, in my opinion, um, in looking in this market, there's going to be something you don't like about every deal. There's just it's going to be roof related, insurance related, location related, or price related. It's one of those things that's going to bite you, and you're just not going to like it. You're not going to like it for your family or your client. The quicker we can understand it, account for it, and still make a decision, the better off we'll be. But in, in your case, Mike, we're having to go through that pain in the meantime. We're having to make multiple offers, lose out on this property, terminate that one. But over a six-month process, a three-month process, six-week process, we will educate ourselves very quickly on this market and what what kind of risk we need to be able to tolerate because there's going to be something there just will be the other part of it is this is so wildly different from my investor client that i was excited about a few minutes ago this is a buyer who doesn't have anything else to go to as far as housing this is not this isn't just like hey we get it great no this is required this has to happen um you have a rental if you know the rental is expiring we have a deadline. We have real consequences if we can't find something. And so if you overpay by 5% today, um, you know, maybe the mortgage rates will go down next year and we can refinance. Maybe the prices will go up across the board and thank God we bought something instead of being subjected to a rental that's going to go up 5 or 10%. You know, let's lock it in today. Yeah, there might be risk on the downside, but there might be upside. And we don't know, but again, we have to be comfortable with the risk. 
And so if Mike, if you and, and your wife were buying something for yourselves, if you were buying a second home for yourselves or whatever it may be, your risk tolerance might be very different than, than someone like your daughter who needs it for totally different reasons. You, She's going to allocate a higher percentage of her uh, net income towards this housing than you'd be comfortable with. It is what it is. You know, um, Christian, the one thing that I've learned through this, and this is, comes through looking at it from a different avenue, I understand the hurt when your offer is not accepted. Pretty brutal. And, and I never understood that before. I just, you know, you hear their offer wasn't accepted, but you don't realize how much it hurts the people. I mean, how, how it rolls through the family. And, you, you know, you put your best offer out there and it's still not good enough. Yeah. That's tough. I mean, that's tough. <clears throat> it's twice as hard when it's one of your children, Mike. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, I was practicing in Atlanta when COVID started and we saw this because, uh, and I tell your daughter every day, I say, just so you know, you're not the only one going through this. Every one of my clients in Atlanta was like this. Um, Naples is different. It's a different animal. It, 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 Bonita, Marco, Fort Myers, it's just different for a lot of buyers uh, where it's not as key to their survival. But everywhere else in the country, what she's going through and what these these buyers who need a mortgage are going through, really normal. I went through it myself last year when I was buying a house. I got a mortgage. And uh, I was grateful that the seller understood it. You know, they didn't hold the market against me and say, it needs to be a cash deal. They said, okay, we understand. Uh, we're willing to accept it. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. But it, so I guess in, in summary, uh, just trying to give people the perspective that there are there's more than one way to look at these things, but listen to your client first. Um, even the simplest thing of if you're looking for a community with a pool, community with a pool, house with a pool, we want a pool, we want a pool, and then you find a place that has no pool, and the buyer falls in love with it, mm. and they just assume they can put a pool in the backyard, maybe they should ask. Maybe they should bring that up again to them and say, hey, I know you really wanted the pool and this one doesn't have it, which is fine, but do you want to get a survey? Do you want to ask the association if you would be approved for a pool? Do you want to see, call a pool company and get a quote? I think that is huge. You will, the, your client will fall in love with you. It could prevent a significant breaking up if you didn't bring it up uh, at some point and the buyer wasn't remembering it. Um, Add that right uh, into their purchase too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, so it's, um, and separately it could be a rental. You know, you've got a, a buyer that's looking to rent a property and they're fine and stuff and this one and this one. And then you got to ask them, hey, did you double check to see if you can actually rent in this community? Mm -hmm. Value add. That's a, it's such an important part of our job. Um, thank you. Mike, Jerry, Kent, Dad, thank you. Um, Good, good job, luck, Chris. everybody. Thank you for joining. Never you need us, just call any one of us. Um, I will not block your call like Mike did. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs>